Good afternoon and welcome to today's meeting of the Con Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know. You can find us online at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook and Twitter, and on our YouTube channel. I'm Corey Shockey of the Hoover Institution, the moderator of this afternoon's conversation. I uh, was the Director for Defense Strategy on the National Security Council in the Bush Administration and the Senior Policy Advisor of the 2008 Palin-McCain campaign for President. But I think the reason that the Commonwealth Club asked me to moderate this discussion was that I also held the Distinguished Chair in International Security Studies at West Point, the alma mater of Wes Clark and a place where he taught economics back in his youth. Um, Wes is, he was a soldier in service of our country for 34 years, I think. He graduated as the valedictorian of the class of 1966 at West Point, was awarded a Rhodes Scholarship, studied in Britain, held a number of enormously influential and important military positions, culminating in being the Supreme Allied Commander Europe, the senior NATO military commander, during the Kosovo Air War in the 1990s. Um, and in retirement, he has been an investment banker, a big shot businessman, an author of several good books, uh, one of which he is here today to talk to us about. Won't you join me in welcoming Wes Clark? His terrific book, my copy of which I do not have with me, Doc, on it, um, is about, ah, thank you, here we go, Don't Wait for the Next War. It is a cri de coeur about the lack of strategy the United States currently has, our incapacity in understanding and preparing for the set of challenges that our country is facing. And he has very nicely foregone giving the typical 15-minute uh, talk about his book in order to maximize his time for conversation with you all. But I want to toss you a couple of softballs at the start, my friend. Okay. The first of which is tell our audience who have not yet had the chance to read the book the two or three things you most want them to understand from it. Hmm. Well, the title of the book don't wait for the next war comes because that's what Americans always do. We always wait for war. You know, we, what, I think when George W. Bush was running for office in 2000, he was saying he wanted to be like a CEO president. But the last CEO we had on this side of the Atlantic was George III, and we fought the Revolutionary War <laughs> against him. We, we don't like strong executive leadership. We have separation of powers. We have checks and balances in the Constitution. And we believe that the, the politics works best if you get the issues out, resolve them, let interest counteract amb interest and ambition counteract ambition in formal institutions. We show it all in public. And that's the way the American system works. The result is that, that um, we wait to be challenged. We were fortunate because we had a couple of oceans that protected us. But the reason I'm saying don't wait for the next war now is because there are some enormous problems coming our way. And it's not just ISIS. It's not just Putin. It's the fact that the culmination of these issues is will threaten our ability to lead the world and manage events the way we've all become accustomed to really since the end of the Second World War. We set up the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, NATO, the treaty with Japan. We fought wars in Korea and Vietnam. We had the Soviet Union. Ike told us, come together. There's so much evil out there that if we're not strong, if we don't submerge the differences between Democrats and Republicans, we can't cope with the challenge posed by the Soviet Union. And it was a winning formula. It mostly worked for 40 years. Now, Democrats and Republicans never got along that well, but you know, Republicans are always like, let's get some more weapons, let's be tougher, don't trust these people. And Democrats are always like, hey, can't we have a nice agreement? I mean, they look like we could share vodka with them and stuff. <laughs> and so, so there was always a disagreement in this, but it worked for the administrations of, for Ike, 
for Kennedy, for Nixon, for Carter, for Reagan, and then we lost the Soviet Union for Ford. We lost the Soviet Union, and when we lost the Soviet Union, we lost our adversary. We also lost our strategy. Now, during the 1990s, when I first met Corey and she was working in the Joint Staff, and I just came in from commanding the 1st Cavalry Division at Fort Hood, Texas, the first question I was asked is, what's the strategy? So this was like a test question. I went in to see General Shali Kashvili, my boss. He says, Wes, with his Polish accent, Wes, what is our strategy? I said, well, sir, I, I, I don't know. He said, go find out. <laughs> so, so we ended up writing a strategy. It took us a year or so, and we finally published it. It was called A Strategy of Engagement and Enlargement. And we thought it was a really good product. Um, we identified the, 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 the nature of the challenges facing us in the post-Cold War environment, and, um, and we, it was erudite. The title sounded like an advertisement for a men's pharmaceutical product, honestly. <laughs> Engagement and what? But, but, but the real problem with it was that Americans weren't engaged in foreign policy. You know, the Cold War was over. There was no challenge out there, so we went our own way. And then, uh, and we had a great decade in the 1990s. We created 22 million jobs, and even the, you know, the, the median wage went up across America. Americans never had it so good. I remember when I retired, I stood on that parade field at Fort Myer. It was the summer of 2000, and I just thought, God, what a wonderful thing it is to be an American. I, mean, I just couldn't wait to get out in the private economy, our investment banking, the dot-com, the technology, all the things I'd been watching and reading about all my life. I, I was 55 years old. I just wanted, just let me out there, coach. And, you know, we were on top of the world. And the armed forces were in such wonderful shape. I mean, when I was a battalion commander at Fort Carson in 1980, the Europeans told us, you guys, don't, don't come back to Europe. Your, your troops, are, they're reckless. They're not disciplined. They're not educated like our troops. Really, it was embarrassing. Boy, nobody said that in 20 years later. We, there was no question. We were the top of the heap. And then 9-11 happened. And it was war. And we came together just like that. 80% of the American public wanted to strike Saddam Hussein, including the newspaper. Some people said, not so fast, not so fast, wait. Maybe, maybe, maybe he doesn't really have these weapons of mass destruction. Didn't do any good. So we brushed, rushed through Afghanistan, whipped, pulled out the recon, left a few troops there, let Osama bin Laden go to Pakistan, and there we were in Iraq. Now it's 2014. <laughs> we're back in Iraq. And people are asking, what's the strategy? That's the problem. We have threats from terrorists all over the world, not just the Middle East. We have cyber threats. J.P. Morgan just got hit. Now, we invented the Internet. We're threatened by our own invention. We fixed the financial crisis of 2008, sort of, but we really haven't. It's not solidly fixed, and it's still shaky out there, and Europe's about to go back into a recession caused by, I think, austerity, excessive austerity in Europe. And China, it's an ascending power. Never before has there been an ascending power that didn't cause a war to sort of break into the system. Can this be the first time? Can we deal with a country that's four times larger than the United States in population and that has a totally different system of government? And they're not about to come over here and say, gee, we really like democracy. Can we, be, can we, can we have like your Congress and everything in Beijing to help us? They've got their own system. And finally, climate change. Every day we're pumping out more greenhouse um, gases into the atmosphere, and every day we're moving toward that mark of 2 degrees centigrade, 450 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's pegged as the danger zone. So we've got big long-term challenges, and then we've got these sharp crises. So I wrote the book to try to give you a frame for how to think about it and to give myself a frame to how to think about it. So, so that's what the book's about. One of the metaphors you use in the book that I very much like it comes from golf, which is the question of which is the most important shot in golf? And the answer is the next one. And